Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. Uh, my name is Mariana Garcia. I'm the Public Programs Manager here at the Connecticut's Old State House, and I want to welcome you all to the third and final installment in our Untangling the Tally series, a uh, look into the election process. Uh, the mission of the Connecticut Democracy Center is to inspire and provide people with a lifetime pathway to active citizenship and the tools they need to take civic action in their own communities. Elections are the cornerstone of a healthy civic life, and that's why we created this series now in the lead up to the 2022 elections in order to take a deep dive into the election process and to help voters feel more well prepared and confident when it is time for them to head to the polls. Today's program will focus on the barriers to voting. Every year, millions of eligible voters find it near impossible to cast their votes and have their voices heard. The reasons why this is so are unique to every individual, but our program today will examine some of these barriers and where we can find them here in our state of Connecticut. Uh, we have a wonderful panel of experts here to talk about, uh, to talk to us about these barriers to voting. Uh, but before that, let me introduce you to our uh, moderator for today, Val Ramos, who is the Director of Strategic Alliance and the Equity Officer at Everyday Democracy since December 2010. He also coordinates the Connecticut Civic Health Project, working with a strong advisory group. Uh, previously, Val served as Director of Constituent Affairs for uh, Connecticut State Secretary, uh, uh, Secretary of the State Susan Bysowitz, where he handled consti uh, constituent outreach and services, poli uh, public policy research and legislative affairs, minority business development projects, and Latino voter outreach. Uh, Val has also, uh, also has extensive expertise in the fields of public and higher education and arts programming and advocacy, and has served on over 25 community and leadership boards. Uh, before we start the program, I uh, hope that uh, everybody watching online is able to post their questions on the comments section, and everybody here in person, if you have a question, hold those to the very end, and I will come to you with a mic so you can uh, ask our speakers their questions. And now, without further ado, uh, barriers to voting with Valdemus. Thank you, Mariana. Gracias. Uh, and welcome, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here again. I've been here at the old State House for many, many times. And uh, it's always great to be here and to be part of the programming, the excellent programming that the Connecticut, Connecticut Democracy Center and Old State House do. So before I start, I want to um, share with you some information that I think lays out the context uh, for this panel discussion. Um, a study published in January of 2022 by the Brennan Center for Justice documented how certain state voting rules and practices have made voter participation disproportionately difficult for black, indigenous, and other people of color. This includes strict voter ID laws, all closings or consolidations, and actually purging voters from the voter roll. As we know, that has happened in many states, especially in the South, but other states in the United States as well. Now, the study also found that the racial turnout gap grew when states uh, enacted strict voter ID laws, and also that, that this persisted even after the laws were repealed. An earlier study, also by the Brennan Center in 2020, found that voters of color around the country reported longer wait times and lines in the 2018 midterms than their counterparts in the suburbs. As we know, Connecticut is no exception. We have had long lines many, many times in many of our elections, in Bridgeport especially, Hartford, and New Haven, as we know. So I'm therefore very pleased uh, and privileged to be part of this panel and to welcome our panelists today. Uh, to talk about the barriers that Connecticut voters are facing in Connecticut. And to start a panel discussion, I would like to ask each of the panelists to talk for no more than three minutes, introduce yourself, and say a few words about the organization that you work with and how that organization is advancing voter engagement and voter participation in Connecticut. And I want to start with Doris Maldonado, who is um, joining us today virtually. Doris, uh, welcome. Buen día a todos y gracias por esta invitación. Thank you for inviting me. I am honored and humbled. I represent several organizations and I am here on the behalf of the Connecticut Council on Developmental Disabilities, uh, of which I am the first Latina 
with disabilities to chair the council in our 51 years since um, uh, since being in statute in Connecticut. I also represent Connecticut Keep the Promise Coalition, where I'm co-chair again um, as of the first Latina uh, chair with disabilities and several other organizations. What we've been working on at the council level is we have a five-year plan that was uh, that began last year. And in that five-year plan, we are intentionally looking into and not reaching out. It's not only reaching out, it's actually engaging communities, of, uh, of BIPOC communities, marginalized communities, the marginalized of the marginalized, which are those of us with disabilities in the, the marginalized communities, uh, to reach out and see what they need, what they want. We need to hear voices, their voices, not assume and, and assumptions. COVID came about and, and, and destroyed that. Uh, for many of us. So we have been intentional in that that engagement, um, asking and having community conversations, conversations with our, our leaders um, and our trusted messengers um, throughout the state. So many of our organizations have done that. Keep the Promise Coalition has led a training. Um, basically, I coined it Voting 101 for those with disabilities and for anyone uh, wanting to know and being more informed on, on their rights and access to the, the information and access to the polls. Thank you, Doris, muchas gracias. Thank you. Steve? Well, thank you so much, uh, Val, firstly. Uh, my name is Steven Hernandez. I am the executive director of a legislative agency that really does focus on equity and opportunity. Uh, for the state of Connecticut. It's a nonpartisan agency of the legislature. We are also, we happen to be the home of the, uh, as we were discussing, the Parent Leadership Training Institute, yeah. which is essentially a democracy school for families. And what's remarkable about the Parent Leadership Training Institute is that it recognizes that what parents share is that desire to leave a better world for their children. That is, a, that is written into the promise that parents make to their children. And sharing that in common and understanding the tools of democracy that are necessary in order to move agenda on behalf of children is really the crux of the educational experience that the PLTI provides. Uh, another way in which the commission uh, promotes civic engagement is that we, we do, of course, understand that this is a representative democracy, but that does not mean that the voice, the direct voice and the lived experience of people shouldn't be at every single table where decisions are being made about them. So that's a little bit about what we do. Uh, we also, of course, advise the legislature uh, in uh, both chambers in a nonpartisan way on issues that impact families. Muchas gracias. Thank gracias you, Steve. A ti. Uh, Yanitzi. Yes, thank you very much for having me. It's a great uh, privilege to be amongst a such great panel. Um, and also here live with the audience. Um, my name is Jenny Tzibeles. I'm the New England Regional Director at Hispanic Federation. The Hispanic Federation is a national nonprofit organization that um, empowers and advances the Latino community. Here in the state of Connecticut most recently, we have been working in empowering other BIPOC uh, organizations as well. And um, specifically around the civic engagement work that we do, it's a very intrinsic with every single core of our programs. Uh, we provide direct services, capacity building trainings and development for nonprofit organizations, and also advocacy. Um, as a nonpartisan organization, we aim to really educate, engage the community, and to give them the tools and the opportunity to really be uh, at the table. And more importantly, to take advantage of the timing that we're living in. In the state of Connecticut, we have a crucial uh, question in the ballot, and as part of our campaign, is to really send messaging, send uh, phone calls, and uh, work directly with the local nonprofit organizations that are serving our communities so they can be, um, as the trusted voices, so they can be also educated on the issues. Um, for us, it's a great privilege to be a, one of those trusted voices within the community. Um, we are recognized at the national level, state level, 
and regional level. And for us, it's really to make sure that everyone gets out to vote in the midterm elections and in the presidential elections. Thank you, Yanisi. Gracias. Yo. Thank you so much. Buenos dias. Uh, appreciate being here. Um, so I am a social studies teacher uh, at the moment. And before I forget, I promised my students I'd give them a shout out. So hi to <laughs> EO Smith High School. And the, you know, if the kids are watching right now on their phones, put them away if you're in class. But um, uh, I've been teaching for 13 years. And um, uh, before I was a teacher, and I should say that I, I've been a civics teacher for almost the entirety of that, that time teaching. Um, but before I was a teacher, I was very passionate uh, around you know, politics, political science major at UConn. And after I graduated from UConn, um, I took on a role as the UConn College Democrats campus coordinator. Um, and uh, my job was to register uh, students to vote. Um, so we were going through and we knocked on something like 12,000 uh, student dorm rooms to register voters. Um, it seemed like it was going to be a close election. We didn't realize how close it would be. It came down to uh, uh, 93 or 83 votes. Who's counting, right? <laughs> um, it was a very close election. So that was very exciting and sort of um, reinforced my um, passion for, for civic engagement. And then later on, I went to work at the state capitol for a couple of years, and I ended up working in the Senate President Pro Tem's office. So uh, certainly a lot of connection there. Thank you, Joe. I actually I remember meeting Don, Donald Williams when I used to work for Secretary of the State, Susan Bicewick, then Secretary of the State, Susan yes. Bicewick. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's start this conversation. I think uh, one thing I want to mention is that in 2022, the cost of voting index, which by the way, I had not heard of this, of this, um, <coughs> this uh, academic study. So I learned something new. Every day you learn something <laughs> new. It's a nonpartisan academic study that analyzes the effort required to cast a ballot in each state, right? And Connecticut ranks number 30 in the nation, number 30. This study takes many factors into consideration, including ease of voter registration and average time spent waiting in line at the polls. That's probably one of the reasons why Connecticut didn't do so well. Right? Despite this, a record 1.86 million Connecticut residents voted in the 2020 election, right? Nearly 80% of registered voters in the state. So I have a question for Yanitsi, and maybe Steve, you can also join in the answer. From your perspective, Yanitsi, why is Connecticut in the bottom half for how hard it is to vote here? And the second question is anything you would like, I'm off. I'll ask Steve the same question, Yanitsi. Well, I believe that the state of Connecticut has been historically uh, recognized um, as a state that has strict voter laws that do not facilitate the full participation of voters to, to participate in the electoral process. Um, part of that, it's the long waits. Um, and also we need to take into consideration that while we have some limitations for the entire state, some of the communities, like the BIPOC communities, Latinx communities in particular, are more affected by one of the, by those decisions that are made by our elected officials and the constitution that has not changed to favor um, the voter participation of these communities in particular. Wait in line, I would like to say that if you compare black and Latinos versus the white comfort neighborhoods, they wait 30 minutes more than the regular average voter. Um, and that led voters to really feel like I can go easy out of the line. Um, this motive, you know, like they are not motivated to stay. Also, another issue is the language access that has really affected throughout the years um, to really empower other people who speak other languages, not only Spanish, which is one of the main uh, foreign language speaking here in the state of Connecticut, but also uh, Chinese, Portuguese. Um, these individuals who are eligible voters really don't seem themselves represented in the poll places or in their communities or for that matter, even electoral um, or leadership uh, representation. And when they go there, they want to be informed. They want to have access to the information in their own language so they can feel fully 
fully engaged in the process and confident in the process. So for those two main reasons, uh, but I will say also that people don't have all the access to it because the, we don't have early voting. And um, I'm sure that we will talk more about that, I hope so, uh, because really that's one of the things that is affecting our communities in particular to go in larger numbers to go to turn out to vote. Uh, the lacking of transportation, um, access to get out of work, uh, when you're not working in the polling place, you know, like things like that really affects the intentionality of a voter to cast their ballots. And to really, it's not that they don't make it priority, is that it's really hard to get out to vote in the state of Connecticut. Absolutely, thank you, Denise. Steve, you wanna add anything? I, I really appreciate the, the, the distinction that you drew between the structural barriers yeah. to voting, which are, you know, are myriad, but also the real honest to goodness question I think people ask, why does it matter to me? Why should I be engaged? And what we realize by asking that question is, voting and the act of voting is the should be and is the culmination of a series of relationships that happen throughout the life and the year of a person. And if that person feels disengaged, that they have difficulty reaching their elected officials on any given day, if they don't have the ability to carve out part of their day, right, to engage civically because of all the pressures that they may be experiencing, the question inevitably comes to, why does it matter to me? How am I going to make a difference? And that, that commitment to why it matters to you and the commitment of removing structural barriers is a commitment that policymakers need to make first and foremostly and everything else, right? Uh, the safety, the integrity, all of those things follow. First and foremostly is a commitment to access. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I want to give Doris the opportunity to maybe add some comments on that. Doris? Thank you very yeah. much. Um, overall in the U.S., voter turnout in 2022 decreased lower than 7% for voters with disabilities um, than, than voters without disabilities. Access, inclusion, and transportation. In the middle of a pandemic, we've always had transportation issues. We face discrimination biases and um, we're ostracized because of our disabilities and further ostracized if we're from a marginalized community. We remain the marginalized of the marginalized. This administration has not only discriminated against and unfairly burdened individuals with disabilities, but it perpetuates discrimination against people with disabilities as experienced with COVID, when our people were refused entry into medical facilities um, with our caregivers at PCAs, we were then afforded the opportunity of receiving the vaccine and against CDC guidelines and the ADA, this administration changed their minds the days before um, and denied access to people with disabilities and those in immunocompromise. We feel right, rightfully disenfranchised. I've witnessed leaders boasting about institutionalization despite its inefficiency and failure to serve individuals with an equal right to live successfully in a community setting. Do your legislators have experiences with disabled peers? Mine don't. President Roosevelt became disabled with polio and was generally pho uh, photographed from above the waist to avoid that stigma then. What is compelling us now, if we are not reflected by the leadership, we vote to empower. Thank you so much, uh, Doris. Um, obviously, we have already addressed uh, many of the barriers. And there, one thing that, that we've all noticed is that there are people who, who always don't understand why people of color turn out to vote. And we, we talked about some of the barriers here. Any other barriers that you think? And I, I know, Joe, you're gonna talk about uh, you know, civics education uh, later on. But you, you want to talk a little bit about that right now as a barrier, and then later you'll elaborate more? Sure. Um, I work in a social studies department, and so um, I, I look at this issue through a history lens, too. Um, and I got here a little bit early, and I was walking through Hartford, and I walked down to the statue of uh, Abraham Lincoln shaking the hand of um, Harriet Beecher Stowe. And it reminded me that um, it wasn't that long ago in the scope of history that we fought a civil war over, um, you know, ultimately this issue of equality and how we look at it. And I think that ripples 
that, that ripples through history, and I don't think the issues um, of that war were settled when the war ended, right? So I think we're still dealing with this legacy in history. Um, uh, you know, I also think the question was a really good one that, that uh, you know, in order for people to vote, or the point was a really good one, that in order for people to vote, they have to be motivated to vote. So, so education plays an absolutely critical role there. That, and, and, and that's why I'm really proud that Connecticut has mandated civics education. I think we're going to get to this more later, but um, uh, we require all of our students to have at least a half credit, a half a year of uh, civics education before they graduate. Very important to give students a reason to, to, to vote, to understand how, what their role is in our democracy. Yes, and, and, and that was passed, I believe, in 2015, right? The, uh, I think that's right. 2014. Yeah. Uh, and uh, clearly, I mean, one of the things that I've, I've noticed over the years working with the Civic Health Project, for example, and others, uh, Sally, Sally Whipple is a member uh, of the Civic Health Project, is that for communities of color, civics learning has not been um, there hasn't been a lot of opportunities for civics learning for people, students of color in, in Connecticut. And I think that that's a disparity that is inherent, has been inherent systematically because of the focus on, especially for, for students of color on reading and writing and math, of course, uh, bringing up, you know, sort of narrowing the achievement gap, right? But there's always a price to pay, and unfortunately for these children, civics education has been something that they have had to pay, you know, a price they've had to pay for that. So thanks, I know, I know you'll talk more about that later, of course. But let me, let me turn now to, um, to, baling, you know, to language uh, access and information in different languages, because you mentioned that, Yanisi. And one thing that, that you probably know is that in 2020, the U.S. Bureau of the Census notified 10 Connecticut towns, 10 Connecticut towns and cities that they had to provide bilingual voting assistance to those who need it because the population met the minimum requirements of non-native English speaking voters that, to make it a requirement, right? So why is this necessary? Why is it so important for the state to provide language assistance to non-English speakers? Well, because it is essential, a pathway to full voter participation. Um, when we see the population that has grown in the state of Connecticut from the Latino community and other minority groups, um, without a doubt, we need to make sure that citizens, U.S. citizens, um, who would not necessarily feel comfortable um, you know, with the English language as the first language to read, to understand, to really um, carve the information to their, that makes sense to them, and then be able to cast your ballot with a full conscience, it is important that we provide not only language access, but the correct language access. I mean, Span Spanish or Spanish from Spain is not the same from the Caribbean. It needs to be cultural competent. Really need to have a sense of international intentionality behind it. Um, I per se come from Puerto Rico born and raised, and I have been here for around 17 years. For the first 15 years, my work was actually register people to vote, educate them, uh, to, make, to, to help them to become citizens, U.S. citizens. And what I really learned is that really, people love this country. People are committed to the future of this country and the future of their family. So if they already have gone through the whole process to become U.S. citizens, or even those who are second generation and they're left here and not necessarily they, you know, grown with that English language at home, why not to provide them the full access to the electoral process? I think it's a right and more important, it's the commitment, it's the law. And that's why that must be, continue to be a priority for every state. And more importantly, this time, in 2022, we're talking, and we're where there is so much uh, digital and um, uh, technical uh, opportunities to provide uh, language access in so many ways. Thank you, Yanisi. And Steve, you're, you're the executive director of the Connecticut Women's Children Seniors Equity and Opportunity. Did I get it right? You yes, you Commission. did. Okay. <laughs> Um, can you add something about that? Because I sure. know you've done some work in that area as well. In the past. You know, what's, what's remarkable to me is that the state of Connecticut stands among the several states that have not adopted a universal language access law. 
Uh, Washington, D.C. did so a few years ago. There are other states that have universal language access for the top languages that are spoken in the state. What does that mean and how does that manifest? The ability to access your democracy is one of the first things that suffers from that. But imagine the last three years of pandemic, two years of pandemic. How do you communicate vital information to families uh, who are suffering, who are disconnected, if you're not communicating with them in their language? And by the way, which includes sign language and for people who are, who are deaf and hard of hearing. What we learned during pandemic is that there isn't a one size fits all even for that community. You spoke to the nuances of Spanish. So if we're going to commit as a state to real access, then we have to commit to the diversity of the people that we have in our state. Absolutely, and thank you for mentioning that uh, the disabilities, um, the American with Disabilities Act. I know Doris will be talking a little bit more. I have a question for you on that, Doris, so stay there. Uh, but let me, let me just say something else. Uh, young people is always an issue with young people, right? Most people think, oh, they don't care, they're not engaged. We know that's not true because we looked at a presidential election, right, uh, with President Obama uh, in 2008, and we know that that's not true. But, uh, you know, according to the 2016 Connecticut Civic Health Index report and other studies, young people consistently turn out at significant lower rates than older voters, right? Um, in 2020, for example, barely 50% of the 18 to 24 year olds turned out to vote. That is, in, and that is in a year that, historic, that had a historically high voter turnout. So Yanitsi and, and Joe, why do you think that is the case, right? And what should be done to get more young people to be encouraged and motivated, as you mentioned earlier, and all mentioned it, to vote? So, this is something I'm especially passionate about. Uh, to start, um, just a little bit of background. So in the uh, 2020 election, voter turnout nationally was up 11% among young people, age 24 and younger, from the previous election. One of the big reasons for that was that um, uh, no excuse absentee ballot voting was accessible in that election uh, around the country because the pandemic was going on. So it was easier, uh, the hurdles were lower for young people to vote. The other reason, and I think it's a factor, uh, was definitely that there was a lot of interest in that particular election. People were very passionate about, about that election. But still, we have to remember that voter turnout among people 24 and younger in Connecticut was I think 52 or 54%. Mm. So we live in a democracy, and it's, it's based on the principle of popular sovereignty. And when we're looking at the pool of voters in our elections, we're talking about, in, in most of our elections, because most of our elections are not presidential elections, the majority of our elections, we actually have a minority of the electorate that's voting in our elections. And, and young people are unfortunately a large percentage of the reason that that total percent isn't higher. So why are young people not voting more? One of it is the ballot access issue. Um, another, I think, is this issue of, of background and exposure to elections. I think a lot of young, and this isn't showing up in polling, I don't think, because if young people are asked, why don't you vote on election day, a lot of the time they are, they're saying things that are very true, the lines are long, or um, they don't feel like the, the candidates on the ballot speak to them, but I think there's, there's another issue going on that, that I think we don't do enough in education to expose young people to what elections actually look like. I think we contain our, our civics education too much in the walls of the classroom, and I think the, the the learning, the content is very important, but I think we need to do more to actually expose young people to firsthand you know, witnessing of elections and actually taking part in them. It sounds like mm -hmm. you do some of that with, with young people, and I think that's terrific work. We need to do more of that, so. Yanisi, you wanna to add to that as well? Sure, um, because I have worked in the last five, 15 years on the voter registration, voter education campaigns, grassroots, um, mostly in Southeast area. Um, I have seen the combination of elements where young voters really wants to get out to vote. Like here, our panelists just mentioned, it's about access. And we go back to that same word, but with the young crowd, I will say that the young voters in particular, they sometimes they are not used to, to the process and they are new. So while we're talking about specifically those that are voting for the first time 
or the first midterm election or for the first presidential election between the 17s and the 25 years old that they have, you know, and they forgot to register to vote or they forgot to update their voter registration information or they just simply did not gather all the information so they felt confident to go out and vote. I think the access is it's important because right now, since the 2012 Vietnam displaced those states, um, voter registration on a voter election day it was is available, but yet it does comes with some limitations. It has to go to the specific place that has been designated by the town. In addition to that, um, when we go to early voting, this young crowd are in college. They are um, probably working. And or traveling, and they miss that absentee ballot, which it's very strict, right? Very specific to the needs that a voter can apply for. And again, you are not giving them all the range of opportunities for them to be part of it. Um, and they're very aware of that, and I think that is why they are paying attention to forums and all the candidates um, when they are doing town halls, but really they need more access than information. But at the same level, it's at the same level because why, what he said, it's education and the school. It's so important and so crucial to make sure that we are preparing those young voters for success. Absolutely. Steve, uh, one of the things that, you know, I know you're, you've been very interested in is, is in the, the the fact the demographics of communities of color, Latino community, but others, the fact that in the Latino community, for example, it's one of the youngest, right, mm -hmm. uh, demographically, and there are other communities that are as well. So the question about voter education, civic engagement, and all that is relevant. Can you add something about that? You know, the, the close uh, sibling to civic engagement is leadership. And one thing that we deny young people, perhaps because of muscle memory, but also because of a lack of trust, are opportunities to lead, even before they are enfranchised with the ability to vote. What's remarkable about young people is this moment when young people access the tools of leadership and the, the notion of leadership, the ability to lead, right? The trust in leadership. They do it and they lead on things that they're passionate about. And they're not all passionate about the same thing, uh, but they do lead, and that's what's remarkable. So trust young people to lead, and they will understand that civic engagement starts way before they're enfranchised to vote. They will be eager to vote when the time comes. Um, uh, but, but also that access, you know, when you talk about uh, the younger demographics of emerging populations in the state, uh, I, I have to say the same thing. There is a muscle memory to leadership that we, you know, when you and I look on a screen or we look at the halls of power and decision making, there's a muscle memory even in our own eyes to what we expect to see, right? Where are the leaders from? What is their pedigree? Whatever it is that you call that. What is their education? We need to expand our muscle memory so that we start seeing more and more diversity among our expectations of the leaders that are at the head of the table. That diversity has to be demographic, linguistic, so that we commit to leadership uh, in ways that we haven't expected ourselves to in the past. Absolutely, so it's a lot of, it's a lot of factors. You know, the mentoring also is important and also young people seeing young candidates also, because yeah. they usually see these older people, not, not, you know, not to criticize them. <laughs> Joe, you want to add something? Add yeah, that. sure. Yeah, I think, I think that's such an important point, and I think um, civics education is, is a perfect opportunity for that, and I think to some extent we're missing that opportunity right now. And I think, um, so just as an example, um, one of the assignments I give my students every year is a Civics in Action project, and they actually have to go out and experience um, democracy at some level. I think that's not happening often enough, and I think one of the reasons for that is there's um, concern on the, on the part of either teachers or parents that that's risky business, that, that maybe you're crossing the line a little bit if you're a teacher and you're asking your, your students to go and participate. I think, um, on the contrary, we need our students to become leaders at an early age, and civics education doesn't mean it has to be partisan activity. So when I ask my students to be involved in civic education, I'm asking them to, to go take part as a leader in their community. And, and I totally agree with what you said about young people. Young people are incredible, and if you, if you put the bar high in front of them, they will jump to meet it. And so one of the, 
the, the things my students led um, a couple years ago was a, uh, a, a debate between two candidates running for the House of Representatives and then two years later for State Senate. The students co collaborated with the League of Women Voters. They met regularly after school. They invited the candidates in. They came up with the questions and they hosted a debate in front of 100 members of the community. Those students are gonna be voters and they're really passionate about the process now. It's an incredible opportunity, and they were freshmen. These are freshmen, and they were totally in charge. We need to do more of that. I th um, one thing I just want to add to this is, I believe nationally there's not a single state that mandates in their curriculum experiential learning in civics education. Mm -hmm. I'd like Connecticut to be the first. Mm -hmm. We should have experiential learning. It should be part of the process, and, and um, I think we can raise the bar that way. And it's part of what you said, Steve, about m muscle memory, to getting used to being exposed to civic engagement as, as an important part Can of I your life. I want to invite uh, Doris if you want to add something, Doris. <laughs> yes, um, I was. I also co-taught as a teacher uh, civics, and um, I'll, 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 I'll dip into that in the next question. But how do the how do our youth see themselves included and directly impa impacted besides the latest social media trend? Uh, we have in Connecticut CT Casa, which is Kids and Self Advocates. These are youth from 13 to 26 with disabilities that learn about their rights and responsibilities and how to uh, become self advocates. These young people have testified at the LOB at, in DC and have um, also testified in the police accountability. Uh, they've educated medical providers. So we have resources that are siloed, but we have youth already setting and paving the ways and setting the path. We just have to expand on that. Um, I was told recently by leaders that children should not participate in their own educational meetings. Uh, children of all, of all abilities can communicate and it's essential to empower them and their voice so that they grow aware of their choice. Um, it's the law. I've taken my children since they were the, the age of five, I just I have a five year old that just went um, with me to, to vote and register um, recently. And it's especially significant if we are voting at their schools, at their districts, so that they can make that connection and include them in their own school meetings, empower their voice. And at the IEP, at the PPT, at the 504, at the parent, parent teacher conferences, it's the law and so allow them to do so, invite them to do so. Culturally, as a first-generation Puerto Rican, I was taught that children should be seen and not heard. And I've done the contrary with my children. They have been involved in their, in their educational careers, in their political careers, um, and they've learned the difference between civic responsibility and privilege. And it's essential to do that. Thank you, Doris. Before, before we move from this topic, Joe, just a question. Uh, how does Connecticut compare to other states in terms of civics education? I think I know the answer, but yeah. I, I want you to elaborate on that. Please. I hope I have the numbers right. I think there's nine states uh, in the country that require a full year of civics education in order to graduate. Uh, I believe there's something like 31 that require a half year. Uh, Connecticut's one of those states that requires a half year of civics education in order to yeah. graduate. And then the other 10 states don't have a requirement. That doesn't mean they're not doing it at the local level. They might be, but they might not. And that was the case for Connecticut until around 2014. Um, and the previous Secretary of State, Denise Merrill, was actually one of the big proponents yeah. of that sure. civics education right. uh, that, that became law, which was a great, uh, a great step forward for young people. Um, so Connecticut is... It is, it's definitely there. I, I think what Connecticut needs to do more of is, is, I guess here's sort of the change that I would like to see. I work in a social studies department, and in order to be certified and teach in a social studies department, you have to have a history degree. Hmm. But I think to teach, and I don't think someone with a history degree can't teach a civics course effectively, but why aren't we allowing um, uh, college graduates with a political science degree to be uh, teachers of civics. I, I think that that okay. curriculum lends itself in, the, in that it direction. So I would like to see more opportunity for uh, a, a larger number of people who have background in politics to be able to be in the classroom teaching. I think that would be a great, a great step forward. And, and I and 
personally. I think if you think about all the things you, you really cover in a good civics class, founding documents and um, you know the Justice Department, the Constitution, um, important Supreme Court cases through history, the way the legislative branch works, how a bill becomes a law, you start talking about all that and media literacy, which I think even more today than ever has to be part of, of civics education. Covering that in a half a year is a lot to ask, so and so I think I, I would love to see more of a civics requirement, either a year or build it into other, yeah. other courses, but I think that's where we have room to grow. And, and, and also with the civics in action style oh, yeah. learning as well, yeah. because I think the content has to be there, definitely. People have to know their democracy, yeah. but engage I think they also it. have to experience it. Engage it. Yeah. Yes, and I think there has to be more of a push for that. I'm glad you mentioned that, Joe, because uh, I've had many conversations with my friend, uh, Stephen Armstrong, as yeah. I'm sure you know him. Uh, he's the coordinator for social studies for Connecticut, and he's a member of the Civic Health Advisor Group. Uh, and he, two things he said is, one is that the curriculum needs to be more open to action civics or hands-on civics. Uh, but also he talked about how in many places in Connecticut, teachers are afraid to teach on the presidential election, especially you know, the, 20, the, 2016, the 20, uh, 2016 election because of what was going on with the campaigns, right? Um, and so how, how would you, what advice would you give to teachers uh, and to parents also, because parents have a lot of influence on that, so that they understand that it's so important for young people to be aware of and, and understand that talking about elections doesn't have to be partisan. It can be just learning about it. So a lot to, to yeah. say here. So first, Stephen Armstrong is amazing. Yeah. We're lucky to have him in Connecticut. Yeah. Um, and he has been a big proponent of the Red, White, and Blue Schools exactly. program. The Red, White, and Blue Schools program is a collaboration between the State Department of Education and the Secretary of State's office. And what they do is... And the ne Connecticut Democracy Center. And the Connecticut yeah. Democracy yeah, yeah, thank you, of course. And what they do is they, they network with teachers all throughout the state to sort of create a healthy competition between schools around yeah. teaching civics education. I just got an email from, from the State Department about an upcoming you know, opportunity to work for the, yeah. you know, with the Red, White, and Blue Schools program. That's amazing. We need, we need more of that. When it, you know, and I should also say, you know, thinking here also about Doris's comment about um, bringing young people to vote. Yeah. My wife is here today. We just brought our five-year-old to go and vote too. So I love <laughs> that, that we're, yeah, exactly. That's so right. that's, that's terrific. And I think we, we have to encourage parents to encourage their young people to go to the polls and vote as well. Um, but uh, I'm trying to circle back to the, the question you had also had was about, about teachers being afraid to. Yeah, yeah. that's a really challenging yes. issue. I, I've heard, I, I feel really lucky because I teach at a school where my department head, my principal sort of, they really encourage me to, to push the civics in action work that I do, the experiential learning. But I know that's not the case at every school. I think the advice that I'd give you know, to parents is reach out to your civics teachers and encourage them to do that sort of work and support them when they're doing it. I think the advice that I'd give to teachers is that I think it helps to be proactive and transparent. So if you know that you want to implement um, like a civic activity in your classroom, reach out to your administration ahead of time. Let them know why you're doing it. Let them know how it connects to the curriculum. Um, and Similarly with parents, let them know the reason for the work that you're doing and, and be clear that it's not because it's partisan work. We're not trying to impart um, a political perspective with our students. We're trying to help them understand our democracy. And we're sort of tying our hands behind our back if we're trying to do that without going and experiencing that democracy. So Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think parents play a key role because uh, some parents are going to be going to the teachers and complaining, why are you teaching about this or that? If you have parents who say the opposite, then that's a way of supporting teachers so that they are not only hearing the negative, but they're also hearing the positive. And school districts will pay attention to that. If they only hear about parents who are complaining about how we shouldn't teach this in the classroom and not the other message, they're gonna to listen to that message, right? So I think that that's important. We're getting close to the end, I think, but I do have one more question to ask Doris because I think this is an important topic, you know. How do we provide access to people uh, with challenges and disabilities? And one thing is unless people have a relative or a close friend who has a disability or a physical, emotional, mental challenge, most Connecticut residents don't know 
very, they know very little or they don't know enough about the voting laws, right, that protect and provide for voters with disabilities. Um, and I have a question for you, Doris. What are some unique hurdles that people with disabilities in Connecticut face and what laws exist to protect them? Um, and then how does Connecticut compare with other states on that? Sorry. Um, that is a, a tall order to, to try to squeeze in, and I'll try to do my best. Um, with one in four people nationally impacted by a disability, many of us not, may not be familiar uh, with our rights, of our rights, and neither are those working at the polls. So as co-chair of the Keep the Promise Coalition that I mentioned before, I can boast that we've been successful with providing a free virtual training that I've coined Voting While Disabled. There are other, there's others that the council has funded, the Connecticut Disability Developmental Disabilities Council has funded throughout the years. But knowing that the, the knowing the law and protections are the hurdle. Um, in Connecticut, but in, but in statute, people with an intellectual disability have the right to vote unless a probate court has specifically ruled that they are incompetent um, to exercise their right. Now, Connecticut law does allow the supervising officials at the polls um, the authority to reject a ballot when they are unable to determine how the voter wants to, to vote. So it's at the discretion of the, the officials at the, at the polls. Um, this seems so subjective, but in statute, I've heard horrific stories where our people, my people, uh, people with IDD, um, or nonverbal people can are turned away. Um, so there's no constitutional disqualification provision. Persons under hospitalization or treatment for psychiatric disabilities may vote unless such patient has been declared specifically incapable of voting and appointed a conservator. In addition to these statutes, this should be included in the ADA disability plan for every town. Every town is supposed to have an ADA uh, plan. So first, contact your town and ask. Uh, we have the right, we have several rights um, that are established to accessible polling place. Accommodations can be made if we have dis difficulty standing in line. We have the right to use a ballot marking device. We have the right to vote independently and privately. We have the right to receive assistance when casting our ballot. We have the right to review a sample ballot and receive instructions concerning how to operate the voting equipment before, before voting. We can request curbside voting if we become temporarily incapacitated when we arrive at the polling place. We have the right to vote by absentee ballot. Voters with print disabilities have the right to request accommodations. We can participate in supervised absentee voting if we reside in a nursing home, assisted living, or other qualified institution. We can obtain permanent absentee voter status if we have a permanent disability. Voters with permanent disabilities can apply to our town clerks for permanent dis uh, absentee ballot status. We can obtain an emergency absentee ballot if we are suddenly injured, taken ill, or have been out hospitalized within six days of the election. Only, only a judge or probate can decide whether or not we are competent to vote. So my question in, 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 in all of those rights that we have and have had for quite some time, um, you know, we're asking our voters, are we asking our voters directly if they need um, uh, assistance? And we can go into that later on, but how that needs to be improved. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Doris. Uh, how does Connecticut compare to other states, though? I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> that would be subjective. I can't tell you how we compare to other states. I can. Um, I've had national conversations, and although we're, we're a small but mighty state, it's been disappointing. As I reflected back on what happened in COVID, where we were sent back and disqualified, discredited, and disenfranchised for being disabled, um, we, have, we have definitely um, rural areas, because we, 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 we 
um, I'm from I'm from the city. I'm, I'm I was born and bred in in the city, so um, I tend to work in urban areas. But now I'm working in rural areas, and they suffer the same inequities and 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 disabilities or or lack of access and transportation that we do in 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 the in the cities. So where we could do a better job, definitely. That's what I thought. Thank you so much, Doris. We're getting close to the end of the panel. Uh, I do have one question, one final question for each of the panelists. How, um, why is voting so important to the health of our democracy? Steve. You know, as a, as a federal republic, we actually are, by agreement, a collection of democracies. And each one of our states has the ability to perfect and improve upon access to our democracy in the state in which we live. Each one of our states has that solemn duty, in fact. So uh, the reason that it's so important is because it really does, you know, you, they say all politics is local, but all civics is every day. And unless we commit to civic engagement, it will be virtually impossible to continue in the social contract that we have all agreed to uh, and that we continue to perfect and re-energize every year. Wonderful, thank you, Steve. Let me see. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Why is democracy so important? Oh why, why is voting so important to our democracy? I apologize. Okay, well, um, first of all, the, regardless of how you came or if you were born in United States, democracy is what it makes United States so beautiful. It's really one of the blessings that we have to fight every day, and we cannot forget who fought for democracy before us. Um, but regardless, it is important every single day, because every day there are decisions that impact individuals, families, neighborhood, communities, the state, the nation. And we need to be aware of those changes. We need to be aware and be part of those decisions. We cannot sit on the sidelines and wait for things to happen and then react to it. So civics and democracy, like Stephen said, you know, somehow it's, it's intrinsic with everything that we do and for everything that we work for. And it's important that we need to um, provide the installments in our children and future generation so they value the work and also protect your future through that. Because it's a system that ensures the opportunity for everyone to have a right to raise their voice and to be heard. Gracias, thank you, Yanisi. Joe. Yeah, so we are um, a government of, for, and by the people. And in order for that government to flourish, we have to have participation from the citizenry. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that hasn't come up at all yet in the discussion is making sure that our, our citizens are informed voters. Of course, education yep. is the purpose That's of that, right. but not only do we, we need to go, we need to go beyond just voting, but we need to make sure that we have informed voters. Um, and so uh, literacy in our democracy is really important to that. But but c certainly, the, the problems that we're facing today are solvable, but only um, if, if we're participating at high levels in, in, in a thoughtful way. Exactly. Doris. Because it's the law. Um, <laughs> black, indigenous, and people of color, disabled people, and older adults have historically experienced and continue to experience systemic discriminations. We face pervasive negative biases and inaccurate assumptions about our viability, value, quality of life, capacity to communicate and make decisions. There's a tendency to group all persons who uh, experience disability as if we were members of a homogenous group and we're not. The council has empowered self-direction, self-determination, and person-centered services so that we may enter the workforce and any force in a meaningful and gratifying employment as individuals living with inalienable rights to live liberty, life, li liberty, and the pursuit of felicidad in our own homes and communities. There's nothing about us uh, without, uh, without us, and nada sobre nosotros sobre nosotros 
And I wanted to 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 uh, conclude my my uh, my my testimony today, um, and quoting Justice Sonia Soto Sotomayor. There are uses to adversity, and they don't reveal themselves until tested. Whether it's serious illness, financial hardship, or the simple constraint of parents who speak limited English, difficulty can tap unexpected strengths. We need to, to be united once again. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. Thank you very much. Uh, before I, uh, again, thank the panelists, I uh, just want to mention how important it is, and uh, you mentioned to be informed as a voter, there will be a constitutional amendment question, right, on the ballot on November 8th. Uh, it is so important that everyone be informed about that, and you can choose yes or no. If you choose yes, that will authorize the Connecticut General Assembly next year to begin the process of developing a voter, uh, early voting program for Connecticut. If you say no, that won't happen. We won't have early voting. voting. And Connecticut is in the company right now of four states that are not don't have early voting, and two of them have been some of the most negative states or, or uh, most adverse states with access to voting, Alabama and Mississippi, right? Especially for people of color. New Hampshire is the other state. We need to change that, right? To make voting more accessible, accessible so that people can vote early before election day. And let me just thank the panelists again, Steve Hernandez, Yanitsi, Joe, and also Doris. Uh, please let's give him a round of applause. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know, Mariana, do we have time for questions? We okay. are running a little bit short on time, but if anybody does have any questions, raise your hand and I'll come over to you with the mic. And also, everybody who's watching online, you can post your questions in the comments section of the video. Anybody? No? Let me check the stream real quick. See if I didn't miss any questions. Looks like we are good. <laughs> no questions here from the audience? Well, oh, oh, the gentleman there, yes. Thank you. I, I wouldn't want to waste this beautiful venue if we have a few minutes. Uh, my name is Walter Glom. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council on Developmental Disabilities, uh, which means I work for Doris. I just wanted to make a, a couple comments, uh, and maybe uh, uh, Stephen and our, our civics uh, teacher can, can respond, perhaps. One is on this issue of state-to-state -state comparisons. You know, as a director of a council that's federally funded, uh, I have counterparts in every state and territory, and we're often wrestling with this state-to-state -state thing. State-to-state uh, uh, -state comparisons are diabolical. They're extremely difficult to do, in part because, as Stephen pointed out, you know, every state is its own little world and we do things differently. But on this issue, I would, I would, and we just don't, simply don't have a lot of the data as, as, as Doris, I think, said. But on this issue, I would stay away from that and, and, and simply, you know, assert that you know, this is, a, this is a, a, a right. I mean, it's an absolute right, you know, that's essential to our, our, our existence. So our standard should not be, you know, where are we relative to anywhere else in, in the country? It's, it's, it's the standard is absolute. Right? If there's one person who doesn't have access you know, to the, their franchise, I mean, that we have to fix that. So I mean, that, that's where we have to go with this, I think. Uh, and, and as Doris pointed out, we have, at least for people with disabilities, we have, uh, we have some pretty strong laws and regulations you know, that, that ostensibly ensure access and accommodations. Uh, the issue is implementation. So one of the things I think we need to address in our parent training and in our, in our, in, in, in our teaching our, our, our students is, is what are the remedies? Okay? I mean, when you go and you see an injustice, you know, when you see something that's wrong, what do you do about it? And we get calls, you know, too many calls of people who go to a voting place, uh, ask for an accommodation, ask for the special machine, and the answer is, yeah, we have that, but it's still in the box. Yeah, we have that, but we're not trained to use it. Yeah, we have that, but it's on the other side of town. You know? That's unacceptable. So, you know, people need to know, well, what do you do then, right? Who do you call, yeah. right? How, what's the remedy? Because it's one thing to state these things and say, oh, we got a law, we've got a regulation, it's a right, uh, and people should know their rights. But then the question is, what do you do about it? And, and that's, you know, that accountability piece is something, 
I hope we can we can do more with going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Thank you so much. Mariana, unless there's no other questions, I don't think, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. That was wonderful, Val. Thank you for great moderation. And to all of our speakers, thank you so much for your expertise and your time here today. And also thank you everybody who came down in person and also everybody who's watching online. Uh, this is the last in the Untangling the Tally series and we're very, very happy with how this program uh, and the series has turned out. And um, yeah, I also wanna, before we uh, wrap up, thank our partners from CTN who have been running the stream and recording everything. who have been doing a wonderful job, so thank you very much to them. And uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful time here today and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>